Today is the 49th day of the weeks. That is the seven weeks leading up to Pentecost. The seventh of seven Sabbaths. Jesus was with his disciples on and off for these 40 days, or 40, day, 40 of these days. Then he ascended and they were left alone. There were three major periods in the preparation of these men for the work that lay ahead for them. First, they had three and a half years of watching Jesus work, hearing him teach, asking him questions, and finally, watching him die. This was their first huge preparation period. The three days that Jesus was in the tomb would have been the worst days of their lives. But those days ended with the resurrection. The roller coaster of those few days right there must have been a wrenching experience for all of them. It certainly involved a paradigm change. I mean, they, they, everything in the world turned around for them in a mere three and a half or three days and three nights. Then began 40 days of visits by Jesus. They had a lot of things that needed to be sorted out. They needed to be able to ask questions, get answers, and get things clarified that they hadn't had quite had straight before. Here was where they began to make sense of so many things that Jesus has said and done. I'm sure all of you have had the experience of looking at an optical illusion, staring at it, staring at it, and all of a sudden your mind makes the shift and you can see what's in the picture that you had not seen before. Uh, for some reason, some people love to make those things up and create them uh, almost like a deception where you look at it, you think you see what's there. Only later do you see what is actually in front of your eyes. The difference is that now they have relationships that they can make. They have got pegs that they can hang things on, whereas before they did not. They just had no frame of reference. When Jesus told them he was going to go to Jerusalem, that he was going to be persecuted, he was going to die and be raised again, they heard the words. But they went in one ear and right out the other because there was nothing for the words to stick to to help them to understand and believe. They probably thought it was some sort of metaphor that Jesus was doing because he did that so much of the time. Now the interesting question, or one that occurred to me, is wonder why Jesus didn't stay with them all the way until today, 49 days. He could have ascended on the 49th day, and then the Holy Spirit could have fallen, fallen on the 50th day. That would have made a certain amount of sense. I suppose there is significance in the Bible in 40 days of fasting, in 40 days Moses did, you know, 40 years. 40 is a very significant number. Maybe that's the reason for it. But I think there was more to it than that. For one thing... The disciples needed to see his ascension. It needed to be an event so that they would know that he is now gone. He's going to be with us, but we're not going to see him. He's not going to be a daily presence in our lives. He is gone, and we will not be seeing him anytime soon. That they had to see. He couldn't just go away. He couldn't just stop showing up. He had to be seen ascending. Then, after that, I think they needed a little time to let their minds settle down and deal with what they had just been through. Not only the three and a half years of instruction and witnessing of Jesus, not only the witnessing of his death and of his resurrection, but also the digesting of the special things that they were told in that period of time after his resurrection and before he left them. You think about it for a while. You know, you'd kind of want to go off by yourself and stare into space and, and, and maybe wander back to some places you had been before to kind of reflect on the meaning of all this stuff and what I'm supposed to do with it now that I have seen it, experienced it, and come to understand it. They had been told not to leave Jerusalem, so they stayed. And they understood their job in the broadest possible terms. Now, they had to somehow attach meaning to everything that had happened. I was so struck by Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, when he made the statement that man has a drive to meaning. And I think it's true. We have to make sense out of things that happen. We can't just let them sit out there as nonsense. And so if we can't find sense to them, half the time we make it up, if we have to, 
But we order, it's, it's a process of ordering of things. We have to order the events and put them in some sort of a meaningful frame or we can't deal with them. Ten days were not very long. That is, between the time of Jesus' ascension, which is for us now today would be about nine days ago. It's not very long. But they could begin to get the big bricks into place and then begin to work on some of the smaller things as they went along. They absolutely needed that time. I figure they suffered from a kind of a feeling of unreality. How can this possibly have been real, what we have seen? Uh, you know, here we are standing in a room chatting with one another, and then with all the doors closed, all the windows closed, everything is locked up tight, and one minute Jesus is not there, and the next minute he is. Was that real? And of course, Thomas didn't believe it, the story at all. And he said, unless I put my finger in his hands, unless I put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe it. I can understand that. And so Jesus came back again and explained it to Thomas and said, here, put your finger in my hand. Put your hand, you know, let, let's be sure that what has happened here is real. Now, Jerusalem was real enough. And that is the, th the place where all of the really big events took place that they had to deal with. And I would guess in those 10 days, you can only imagine or put yourself in Peter's shoes and think, didn't that really happen? I mean, what was this? I, I think if you followed him around, you'd find that he would have gone back at one point to the empty tomb. I feel I would have. I would have gone back there. I would have stood there. I looked at it. I would have walked inside. I would have sat down on a little, little stone bench that was there and looked around myself and say, I, I've got to clarify in my mind that Jesus really did die he really was graveyard dead. He did rise from this place, and he isn't here. And to remind himself of what he had seen at that point in time when he went there. Remember John 20, verse, verses 1 through 9. And I have very little doubt that, you know, he could have gone over to John and sat down and talked about this. And John could have said, now here's the way I understand it. The first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early when it was still dark to the sepulcher. John 20, verse 1. Then she runs and comes to Simon Peter and the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, who we believe is John, and said to him, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we don't know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went, and the other disciple, and they came to the sepulcher. They ran there. The other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooped down and looked in, saw the linen clothes lying there, and wouldn't go in. If you go back... And you remember what happened. John had his recollection. Peter had his. Matthew had his story. John had his story. And so it goes. We have the stories now that we have to, have to work out. And I can imagine that every meal they ate together during this period of time, they were rehearsing events. They were saying, I didn't see that. Well, you would know, of course you didn't see it. You were standing over there. It happened over here. And to go through these things... So that the reality of it could really begin to sink in on them. Peter came after him. He, he didn't even slow down. He went straight into the sepulcher and saw the linen clothes lie and the napkin that had been about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, wrapped together in a place by itself. I, people often ask about this. And I don't quite know what to make of it. Uh, whether or not Jesus' body just simply disappeared out of the grave clothes and they collapsed in a heap, you know, right there. You can imagine what that would look like. And yet the napkin was laid off to one side by itself so that it had to be done physically. And the question of the bodily resurrection of Jesus has been one that has kicked, been kicked around Christianity from who knows when. And there seems to be some relevance in this. His body was gone. I don't know how anyone can argue against the bodily resurrection of Jesus when his body was gone. But people do. In fact, I've even been accused of not believing the bodily resurrection of Jesus, which, as I have just now established, I do believe in that very much so. Peter went in and saw it. Then the other disciple followed him in there. And they saw and they believed. For as yet, they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. This is one of those little things you read and you think, 
Okay, the scripture I think had been mentioned back in the ministry time, but they didn't know it. They didn't understand it. They had not been able to put it together with the other things they knew and with what was supposed to happen. And so they went in there and found him gone. Now they have to understand the scripture that he has going to rise from the dead. That other disciples, I said, was John who wrote this passage. He recalled vividly the details. Peter, more than some, had some issues he had to work his way through. He could revisit the very places where he denied Jesus. Can you imagine how hard that would be? To actually go where that little fireplace was, where the people were gathered around, where you were warming himself, and you denied Christ in this place, and you did it over there too, and you did it outside the gate too. I don't know. I, I have a feeling that Peter was the kind of a man who would have to go there. He would have to go there and experience the pain that he had gone through and then perhaps go out to the place to where he went by himself and wept bitterly on that night. Peter is not a shrinking violet. And you know how it is sometimes when we got something that hurts, we have to keep checking it to see if it still hurts. And uh, I think Peter was like that. So I'm pretty sure he went back and he had to work it over. He knew he was forgiven, but that didn't do an awful lot to deaden the pain of what he has done. And I think all of us, you know, in our lifetimes, we have things we have done. We parts of our lives. We know God is forgiven, but that doesn't mean there is no pain connected with the stupidity that we may have done. Peter needed some time alone to sort out the implications of what Jesus told him three times that night, that, that time when they had the meal together, when he said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. So that Peter had to sit and think and also to ponder what he meant when he said, when you were young, you put on what you wanted to put on. You went where you wanted to go. When you're old now, the others are going to take you and they're going to put things on you, on you and they're going to take you where you didn't want to go. And you're going to stretch out your arms signifying by what means he would die. And the legend is Peter was crucified upside down. But that's just simply tradition. So. I have little doubt that all of them returned together or alone to one particular room. They had to come back here again and again. I don't know if it was where some of them lived. I, I honestly don't know. But I do know this was a place they had to visit. John 20, verse 19. The same day at evening being the first day of the weeks, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said this, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. What a jar. What a jar. Twelve of us sitting around, not, yeah, no, only twelve, only eleven now, sitting around in kind of a jumbled way in a room somewhere, doors closed, everything shut down and locked because we're afraid of the Jews. One minute Jesus was not there, the next minute he was. It was as though he was beamed in there, uh, you know, somehow or other. And they had to deal with it. I mean, can you imagine the shock of just, apart from anything else, apart from who it was, that suddenly someone is in the room that wasn't in the room and didn't come in the door. How had that happened? I, I... They, they were glad when they saw the Lord. And I can hear John saying to Peter about, you know, later on, you should have seen your face when that happened. And, and Peter might have said back, well, you should have seen yours too. Because all of them had to, their mouths had to be open. They had to be in total shock. And then Jesus said again, peace be unto you as my father has sent me. So I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now the fellows had to think that statement through, I have no doubt. It is one of the most common questions that I'm asked about, about this passage or about this segment of Jesus' ministry. What did he mean by that? You mean I have the authority, if I'm an apostle, to not forgive your sins? Did I have the authority to remit them? I mean, what is this all about? Well, if you think we got a problem with it, don't imagine for a minute that they didn't have problems with it. Because they believed all their lives 
that no one has the power to forgive sins, but God only. Now, I've talked about this elsewhere, so I won't go into it today. I just want to bring it up to help us understand the problem, the conundrum these men had, and the reason why Jesus showed himself to them for 40 days and then went away and left them 10 days without him so they could begin to sort these things out, put them in new compartments, relate this that belongs over here with this, so they could begin to make sense, to cast meaning on it. Thomas, one of the twelve, Didymus, who was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples said, we've seen the Lord. And he said to them, huh, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into it and thrust my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe you guys. After eight days again, the disciples were within. Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach here your finger, behold my hands. Reach hither your hand, stick it in my side, and be not faithless but, faithless, but believing. Apparently, Thomas made no effort to put his hand in Jesus' side. He just said, my Lord and my God. The confession of Thomas seems to have come as no surprise to anybody. And Jesus in no way rejected it. He, Tom, Thomas saw him as his Lord and as his God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Now, I think what John is talking about here are the signs of the 40 days in those 40 days he was with them after the resurrection. I don't think he's tracking all the way back to the origins. He says something about that later on. But you can't, there's no, he can't get to them all of the things in those 40 days right here. Not so much the signs of the three and a half ministry, but of more recently. And all these things had to be digested. They had to be understood. They had to come to have meaning and clarity to these men. And I think... The past 10 days from today looking back in their lives had to be major storytelling days. Major story. Matthew, for example, I think would have reminded them of one of the last things Jesus said. Jesus came to them and said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. This is Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things whatever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. What do you think he meant, Matthew would have wondered? All power is given to me. I can easily see this, this kind of conversation taking place. This is what he said. I was there, I heard it, and I wrote it down. Okay, what do you think he meant by that? John could have easily pitched in a piece of information at this point. Do you remember what John the Baptist said about this? John, John chapter 3 verse 28. John the Baptist said, You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, I am sent before him. He that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy is fulfilled. He compares himself to a best man. You know, he says, I'm not the man. I'm just the best man. He that comes from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He that comes from heaven is above all. Where did Jesus come from? From heaven, according to John's testimony. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and frankly, nobody receives his testimony. He that has received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. God does not give the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Remember what John the Baptist said that, guys. And that's what Jesus told us. All power is given to me. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. He that believes not the Son shall not see life. 
but the wrath of God abides on him. Said John, John reminding everybody of this. And then he says, what do you make of that, Matthew? And what do you make of the fact that he told us, Jesus, knowing that, you know, that the Father put all things in his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God. Remember? You know, John could have said, you were there, you heard him say this, that he came from God and he's going to God. What do you think he meant by that? Well, Matthew, I think, would have nodded his head and said, yeah, absolutely correct. And he would have gone back to what he, just read, what he had just read to them and he had written down. All authority has been in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, if we sit here and work that out, we say, okay, we are not supposed to go merely to Judea and to Samaria. We've been sent there before, right? This is not merely where we're going. We're going to be going a lot further afield than that. Frankly, I suspect Peter wasn't paying a lot of attention at this point because he still didn't get it like quite a bit later than this. But still, they were supposed to go and baptize people who weren't Jews, even Romans. And uh, they have to ask themselves, does that mean we have to go there? Well, they didn't for a long time, did they? You read through the book of Acts, you get all the way up to chapter 8, and it took persecution to scatter them and to get them out of Jerusalem to go to these other places. I used to cite this as an example of people, you know, not getting a point. At the same time, I realized that one of the reasons that God didn't insist that they get out of there before this time is they still had a lot of organizing to do. They still had a lot of things to understand. They had to, they had to really fully develop the gospel during this period of time. I think it's in this period of time that what a lot of scholars call Q, which they consider a source document for the Gospels that the others drew on. I think Q, what they call Q, is the oral Gospel that was established in this period of time from Acts 2 to Acts 8 when they told the story, told the story, and told the story. And we got in our hymnal, you know, that old song, I love to tell the story of unseen things above. Well, these guys never had any shortage of people who wanted to hear the story. And so they told it and retold it and retold it. And blanks were filled in because there were 12 of them. And they saw things from different angles. And so they had exchanges of information when they began to put these things. Well, they did that. Well, Thomas added, at least he told us he was going to be with us all the way. I think they had a little trouble digesting this. And, you know, frankly, more than we do, because we've grown up many times believing all this. But this was hard for them to manage this thing. For one thing, to carry the gospel to every nation was going to require them to speak in the languages of those people who didn't speak Greek or Hebrew. What are they going to do about taking the gospel to those places? I don't know. You know, they were standing around Jerusalem waiting for something they didn't understand, not even knowing what it was, and they were going to have to take it everywhere? And we, looking back, say, you don't know anything, guys. There were parts of the world where there were people you didn't even know existed at this time. So mankind had gone down to the Horn of Africa and beyond. Man had gone to Asia. Man had gone who knows where, even perhaps to the New World. I don't know by this time. There are those who believe by this time some of them had. They didn't know that. And they had no idea where they were going to go or how they were going to do it or how they were going to communicate when they got there because they didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. They did not know they would get the gift of tongues. Now, it's easy if you understand the history of the Jewish people, if you understand their belief system and everything they've been through, to understand how hard it would be for them to get this particular idea through their head. The miracle that would take place the next day would be an enormous statement of where they were supposed to go and what they were supposed to do. I've said this before. If all of a sudden I woke up tomorrow and had the gift of Spanish and could speak Spanish fluently, I would draw a conclusion that I was supposed to go to some Spanish people and speak to them. It would seem obvious to me that that happened. 
Well, it happened to them. Not Spanish, but different languages, and they're all listed in Acts 2 as to what those languages were. And so they went. Daily prayer was a part of their routine during this period of time. They still went to the temple daily. I wonder which of them might have thought to bring up Jesus' comment about the temple. Remember how he told them in Matthew 24? You know, here we are, we're praying in the temple, we're getting ready to walk back toward the house. You know, you remember the day that Jesus told us there would not be left here standing one stone upon another that would not be thrown down? How long, O oh Lord, do we have? How long do we have? Because they would have definitely seen that as a sign of the end of the age. And they would need to be supposed to have their work done by that time. And I don't know what they might have thought. John, though, might have reminded them of something Jesus said at a strange time and a strange place. It was in Samaria, Jacob's well. A woman came out there to draw water and he asked her to get him, give him some water. He didn't have anything to draw with. And uh, the woman, smarty, smart aleck kind of woman, because he was a Jew, she was a Samaritan and felt like they'd been put down long enough, decided to make her point. And Jesus, of course, told her a few things about herself that he shouldn't have known. She said, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. This is John 4, 19. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You say in Jerusalem is the place to worship. Now, John, remember, reminding everybody of this incident. Jesus said, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. He didn't mean you couldn't worship in Jerusalem. Just mean, what he's saying is it's not just this mountain and just Jerusalem. For you worship what you don't know. Salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Now when you think that through, and they had to think this through, the realization needed, needed to come into their minds that it doesn't depend on this building. They knew that the previous temple had been destroyed and then later was rebuilt. Now they knew that this one was going to be destroyed and for all they knew later rebuilt. And what they also knew was Jesus said, no, 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 it's not a matter of place. It's a matter of spirit and of truth. I don't know. John might be, have said, we may be attaching way too much importance to this building, guys. And I think they'd have nodded their heads and agreed. They had far more questions than answers on this day. Luke made a kind of summary of this short span in his treatise, second treatise he wrote, actually, for a man named Theophilus. You're all familiar with his first one. It's called the book of Luke. For some reason, we tend to forget, maybe, that Luke wrote the book of Acts. This is his second one. He said, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also he showed himself after he was alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So, during this period of time, he is speaking to them day by day. Perhaps some days went by when he wasn't there, but he was still coming back and explaining the things that needed to be explained. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. What in the world did that mean, do you suppose, to them? You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I don't think they had a clue. Only as it happened did they understand. And when they were come together, they asked of him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And that shows what their line of thought was. The returning Messiah or the coming Messiah who would throw out the Romans, restore the kingdom in Israel, and fulfill all whole raft of prophecies having to do with the restoration of the kingdom, including those in Ezekiel. And he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Matthew 24, where they asked the question, what is the sign of your coming at the end of the age? If you want to summarize his whole answer in those two chapters, 24 and 25, it is this. It's not for you to know 
when it is, your job is to do what you know you are supposed to do. And so every day we get up and we look around ourselves and what is it I'm supposed to do today? And we go out and do that and we wait. He said, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the earth. <laughs> you know, that did not happen in their lifetime. That did not happen in their lifetime. It's only really been in the modern world and relatively modern, that we've learned really where all the people are. And my thanks be to God for the people like the Gideons and others who have translated the Bible, I suppose, into every dialect, every language known to man, every language that can be read, that they have, have translated it and have taken the gospel really indeed to the uttermost part of the earth. Interesting question here. What were the last words of Jesus before he finally left the disciples. <laughs> you know, you can keep this one in mind if you ever need it for a trivial quiz. We just read it. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, two men stood by them in white apparel, and they said, what are you standing in here, you men of Galilee, standing right here gazing off into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, from, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they came in, they went to an upper room where abode Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, and Simon, Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Fascinating, isn't it? By this time, his brothers are there. I'm not surprised to see Mary there. We don't hear much of her after this time. But, but his brothers are a little bit of a surprise. Well, they got there. And during these days, and I kind of halfway wonder if it was today, that Peter stood up in the midst of his disciples and said, about 120 of them, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of David, spoke before concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. He's citing a couple of places in the Psalms where this crops up. Psalm 41, verse 7. All that hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt. An evil disease say they cleaves fast to him. And now that he lies down, he's not going to get up again. In fact, my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who did eat up my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Also Psalm 55, verse 12. It was not an enemy that reproached me. I could have borne it. It was he that hated, neither was it he that hated me that magnified himself against me. I could have hid from him. But it was you, a man, my equal, my guide, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel. We even walked to the house of God in company, arm in arm. Psalm 55, verse 14. And so it is that here is one close to Jesus, my own familiar friend. We walked arm in arm up to the temple of God. And Peter went on to say, he was numbered with us. He had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling down headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known to all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that that field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. There are a lot of unanswered questions about how the end of Judas, I won't go there today. It is written in the book of Psalms, Peter said, let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric, his office, let another take. The psalm says more than that. I'll take you back there because I think this one is, is fascinating. It's the 109th psalm. Verse 6. And he's speaking of this one 
who is a type of Judas. Appoint an evil man to oppose him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty. And may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. That's what Peter is citing. May his children be fatherless, his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. May a creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruit of his labor. May no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children. May his descendants be cut off, their names blotted out from the next generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. May the sin of his mother never be blotted out. May their sins always remain before the Lord that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. For he never thought of doing a kindness, but hounded to death the poor and the needy and the brokenhearted. Now, I wanted to read all that to you because Peter didn't cite all of it. There's a, an issue that keeps ri arising on discussions and questions and letters that come in and on the forum and what have you about people, about whether or not Judas will, has had his chance and will never have another. You read this psalm, it really sounds very strongly like that he will be, he and not only that, the people who are responsible for him will be blotted out, and the people, man, I don't, nobody says anything in the scripture about his wife and children, but if he had any, I would not want it to be one of them. It's, it's a classic example of the fact that sin reaches out with tentacles and touches the lives of an awful lot of people. You wonder, well, why did Jesus pick him? Because it was important that if Jesus was to suffer, in every way and be tempted in every way like you and I are tempted. He had to be betrayed because it is a part of living as a human being that people we get close to stab us in the back. It happens again and again and again. So Jesus, in order to be tempted in all points like we are, needed somebody like Judas. And I think he picked a man because he knew what he would likely do. I don't think that, it's not that Judas had no choice. He did have a choice. It's just that Jesus knew what choice he would make. Going back to Peter's speech. Therefore, of these men who accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day he was taken up, we've got to ordain one to be a witness with us of his resurrection. They had to have 12. And there's a story in that, again, that I won't chase that, that particular story down today. They appointed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. I think, out of 120, they were the only two that fit the criteria that he laid out before them. They prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which of these two you have chosen, that he may take place part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go into his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. As I said earlier, I think this may very well have taken place on this day, the day before the Feast of Pentecost, as a piece of unfinished business that had to be done. On the eve of this, the most exciting day of their lives, one wonders what Matthias was thinking about now.